שלום again, כאן, אליהו, and I am uh, very happy and honored and uh, a bit excited as well uh, to be here with uh, a teacher and an inspiration of mine for quite a number of years, uh, Nora Lox from the United States, but really she's a citizen of the world, and we'll get into that a little bit. Um, and uh, how are you today, Nora? I'm good. I'm always good in Israel. Okay. I'm home. <laughs> Nora, you have such um, an amazing and unusual life. That's true. Um, That's true. And I know that you have uh, groups of students uh, that in different countries around the world, and I know also that you, with the help of your students, you help finance um, a charity that take that show. You chose one street in India, is that right? One street in India? That's correct, one and, street in India. And you decided that you, the, your work and your organization would take care of everybody on the street. Um, do you like a little water, please? So um, you you make sure that everybody has enough on this street. I guess it's a poor street in a poor area of the city. These are people who live on the street. They don't have homes. They're uh, refugees from Bangladesh, and they're probably three, four generations into the process. And Whoa, four generations on the street. I cannot imagine it. It's interesting. Um, people are in their way their own little indigenous tribe, except it's down to a street. My God. Yeah. They take care of each other. They're all working their best way they can. Uh, they have nothing. And uh, it was interesting how it all started. I uh, was in Calcutta to speak at a conference on social justice and managed to end up taking care of one woman that was on the street and Whoa. in that process I ended up visiting everybody in the middle of the night uh, in and out of little plastic tents and decided to sort of take on that street as a project. When was that, Nora? Well, it's about, probably about eight years ago. Maybe less, maybe. It's hard to say because I have other projects in Calcutta. So five, eight years ago. Um, what an idea. I know I never heard an idea of somebody adopting a street in a very, very, very uh, poor um, place. Uh, it's an incredible idea. Of course, if, we, if a lot of people would do it, these places uh, would be healed. Um, so, so this is uh, one of the things you do. And you say you have other places in Calcutta, other organizations. We have, we have a school for the poor. It serves about 150 children. We also have an orphanage with Whoa. 40 girls. Um, we have other five other clinics in the Calcutta Basin, which is not in the city. And we also have uh, something called, they call them women's social groups. But what they are is groups for women who have uh, fallen to domestic violence. And it helps them reestablish their lives. Uh, we train them in work, and uh, right now we have a huge project that we were funded for where they have completed a series of 45 hand embroidered uh, pictures which tell the story of them coming out of uh, social injustice into self sufficiency and success in their lives. And that's going to open in Santa Fe, New Mexico, uh, in the first week of July. It will be the beginning of an international exhibition which will travel uh, to Chicago and then. That will end up going around the world. Wow. Yeah. So um, you said uh, we have been funded. Funded by who? Um, I have, it's a private donor who approached us. And oh, I wow. wouldn't, wouldn't want to necessarily say their name because they may or may not want it. It's a foundation. Um, they found out about us uh, through uh, the Christian Brothers in Calcutta. And uh, that was one of those things that's serendipity. And we have a policy that 100% is given is 100% that's given to the poor. 100%? So, yeah. You know, I understand that most charities, most of the, a lot of the famous 
big name charities, uh, uh, quite a small percent relatively gets to the poor um, because of funding of the staff and who knows what. Um, I, 100%, that's incredible. We, uh, those of us who are involved with it just simply pay our own expenses. Well, as a uh, But we're not huge. I mean, we're, we are, don't have a huge infrastructure, but we, our motto is to do a lot with a little. Okay. So. But Nora, um, do you have a website where people, if they want to know about this charity and uh, what it is you do and what it is you teach, um, where they could go and look at your website? Yes. It's linkhandsforhumanity.com. Linkhandsforhumanity.com. Okay. Um, okay, with that incredible beginning, um, I'd like to... Um, I understand um, that you've been on the path of, of discipleship, learning different traditions around the world, um, and uh, for, for maybe most or all of your life, and I'd like to hear a little bit about this incredible spiritual background of yours, this journey. That where, can you remember how it started? Oh, or? Yes. oh yeah. Very easy. Um, my grandmother, who was, came from an area near Vilnius, uh, which is in Lithuania now, uh, then, I'm not sure what it was, because things get divided up, but she came from a shtetl, and she, her mother, and the line of the females in my family, on that side of the family, were all the local um, curandera, we would say in Spanish, we might say a, a shaman, I suppose, in New Age philosophy, but she was the healer and uh, the uh, teacher uh, from, from the village. And uh, she is, came out of Russia and uh, migrated uh, to the United States and then eventually to Berkeley, California. And I began to live with my grandmother when I was three, and I was trained by her until she passed. And she that was her intent. Her intent was for you to be like a healer, teacher? Yeah, absolutely. I was living with her full time. Okay. Lived, my mother lived in, my father lived in Davis, California, and I lived with my grandmother, and I studied with her. And it was uh, until she passed, and she passed when I was 12 years old. Okay. Wow. So that's how I started. Wow. Um, you know, uh, okay, so you, you're of European Jewish descent, like I am. And um, it's f interesting because you really don't hear about a, a tradition of healers, and I mean, I have never really heard much about a tradition of healers and like shamans in, 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 our, in our tradition, and it's interesting that, um, so she was like a traditional healer and teacher. Yes, she was. I haven't really heard about that world. It's uh, not, it's actually not discussed. Okay. <laughs> you hear about I, even I myself don't, and have not discussed it very often publicly. You hear about the rabbis and the yeshiva, mm -hmm. and all of the male traditions connected to the, the holy books, but you don't hear about what you're, what you're talking about. That's correct. Um, and so I didn't even know it really existed. Um, and that's interesting. I am actually in the process of writing a book about my grandmother because it is, I don't know anywhere that it's talked about, but it did exist. It does exist. Um, it wasn't just inside the Lithuanian tradition. I think that there certainly would be Moroccan Jews or, or uh, Jews from you know, other parts of the, country, uh, the world that would tell you the same thing, but it was never discussed. It was one female in the lineage um, that was, it was passed on to. Oh, wow. I never heard about that. Uh, you know, we've been living, not only the, the Jews, but we've been living in such a patriarchal society. You only hear about, um, about the male side of things. And, um, and, it's very, and, well, that's changing big time right now. And so this information is, uh, is actually very important. Well, she came from an interesting family. I mean, it's a typical Jewish story in a way, but her, her grandfather had um, you know, gone out to pick apples at 10 years old, and, the, and when he came back, the whole village was gone. 
everything, you know, everybody was killed. All everyone the, was killed. Everyone, you know, there wasn't even a mouse that was moving around. Uh, around and, what year was that? Uh, you know, I can't actually pinpoint the year. I wish I could. Okay. Um, I do have and have. Oh, but these things were very common. Very common. Very common. They and were persecuted and murdered and pogroms right. and you name it. Um, so this young man became a very well-known rabbi in his area and he had 18 children. Whoa. And one of which <laughs> was the... From one wife? Pardon me. Huh? What? One wife? Yes. Was it w wow. One wife and he had 18 children, one of which was my, uh, my, my, mo my grandmother's uh, father who was a cantor and also was involved in the uh, Masonic tradition that was connected to Judaism. And oh, now that's another subject. That's another subject. That I know nothing about. Right. Well, there, there was and is, and I don't want to go into length about it, but that is another sort of not well-known, but known tradition. Usually people associated with England and Europe, but in fact it did come out of our and it's connected to our tradition. So she grew up in a family with a cantor and a, essentially a mystic, a sonic mystic. And uh, her mother, which came from a, you know, not different family, not her grand, her father's side, carried this other tradition. So you can see how these two people, her father and mother, might have found each other. And uh, so that's, you know, that was my beginning. And I was close with my mother and close with my grandmother, but. I was, it skipped a generation, and it was me that received the, the lineage. Okay. Uh, you know, one day we could have a really nice conversation. Yes, we can. About the, uh, about <laughs> the Jewish Masons and about Masonry uh, in general. Um, some people see them as uh, behind great evil in the world, and other people point out that uh, they were really keys in founding the United States, which... Uh, well, Which this particular tradition, I mean, you have to understand we're going back before most of what people are talking about today. Okay. Yeah. Wow. And it is known about because um, my daughter is um, dating a, a Russian Jew from uh, Belarus. Okay. And he just finished a double master's at Brandeis University. And he and I have had some very good talks about this mystical tradition in Jewish uh, culture that goes back to the Russian, uh, you know, Lithuania, Belarus time, and he in fact did study some of this when he was in Brandeis. So it does exist. The and he was fascinated, obviously, that we actually had some direct connections to this. Well, it, and uh, it's very interesting. I don't want to devote time to it because there's so many things. Um, right. But yet it's very interesting. Well, you asked about my background, so there, okay. that's where it started. And you know, it's so interesting, Nora, that. The God brought you to Berkeley, California, because right. uh, Berkeley was the, uh, the center of uh, an intellectual, social, maybe spiritual also revolution in the United States that really um, has had a huge impact on the world. Were you involved in all of that unrest and change which was going on in Berkeley? Yes, of course. Oh, I, yes, I lived there. <laughs> what can I say? I, was, I actually ended up going to the University of California, Berkeley, and I was there during the time of the free speech movement, and I actually lived in a house with um, you know, Laugh, Mario Savio, and Ooh. I had, well, that doesn't mean anything to you, but <laughs> anybody who's listening who knows about that rebellious time, but I actually was had a room with my... Um, husband at the time, uh, I was married to a Greek and who has who passed away, but um, he, um, he and I li had a little small room, we were going to college and we were in the middle of this whole, you know, world. And also very much involved with the uh, c uh, civil rights movement and the um, lots of confrontations with the Oakland police and Whoa. You know, all of those kinds of things. I would call that a karmic setup. Uh, <laughs> how how you were brought uh, exactly to the place of all this um, ferment and... Um but it makes sense. I, I have to tell you a little bit more about my grandmother who I'm good writing, going to write about, but when she came to, um, finally came to uh, 
through Ellis Island into New York City. Uh, she was uh, a, a, not an a intimate acquaintance of uh, Emma Goldman, but close enough that she was involved with the unionization of uh, New York City. And uh, Emma Goldman, who wrote the words on the Statue of Liberty, yes, is that right? Yes, yes. The poet, yes. Give me and your poor and your hungry and so on and so forth. And then yes. she went ahead and she fell in love with a black Baptist minister after her first husband left her. Oh, your grandmother? Yes, my grandmother. And she had had two children and um, had married a Jewish man, but he had run off. And she ended up going down to Florida and living in Jim Crow, Florida with him until he was uh, killed. Whoa. And then she finally ended up in Berkeley. So I have a good tradition of uh, social, uh, a very strong tradition of social justice. You certainly do. In my bones. So it's completely, would be completely normal for me to want to liberate the blacks and to make free speech and God only knows what else, uh, you know, as a young person. It was, was just, it was a driving passion. He was killed? Yeah. Why was he killed? It was Jim Crow, Florida. And he was living with a white woman? Living with a white Jewish woman. Well. It's even more. Do you know, there were, the prejudice was both, both against the Jews and the blacks. Yes, I'm aware. So it was very intense. It and was very intense. Yeah, very. And uh, she managed to escape and uh, came across uh, with the two girls, my mother and um, her sister, and ended up in Berkeley, California, where she had a small tailoring studio and continued to serve. She um, dur was there during the Depression, and she took care of Benny Bufano, who some of you may remember his statue of St. Francis by the Golden Gate Bridge, and he was sort of the sculpture laureate at the time, and she used to feed him and all the starving Russian artists that wow. came to um, to San Francisco and Berkeley up through her tailoring. So she was not only the, a healer, um, she was also a strong, um, like strong, strong arms around a whole community of people. Like yeah. you, like she'd be very, uh, she'd be very proud of you, Nora. No doubt about it. Uh, I'm very close to her. She she died when I was 12, but. Um, it's like there's no time. Well, there is no time, is there? And she's around, I'm sure. Oh, she's yes. been guiding you, and I'm sure she's around. I could maybe even feel it. Um, okay, so, uh, well, what about your spiritual odyssey? Uh, what, can you describe that a little bit? Well, I came out of the, the training with my, my grandmother, and uh, the next thing, I, I really was quite bereft um, about losing her, and um, I immersed myself actually in a life as a, a Quaker. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, and I, I respect and admire the Quakers, even though they're sort of against Israel, which I don't like, um, but um, I, I, I like the Quakers, yes. And so I found, um, I found a home there while I was sort of recuperating from my losses, and uh, I studied, um, at that time I began to read um, probably just about everything I could possibly get my hands on in terms of understanding uh, the world religions. I also have to say that I, my, during the time that I was with my grandmother, I was always also trained uh, as a Jew. I you know, went to synagogue and I had my, um, I didn't actually go through a, a bat mitzvah, but I was brought into an understanding of the prophets in, in our tradition, our spiritual tradition. But when my grandmother died, I decided to get myself baptized, and I began to study a Christianity, and the closest that I could even get close to that was through the Quaker tradition. Uh, it was too, um, too hard for me to get involved in, in regular uh, church life. But there was an impression uh, that I had uh, when I was uh, very young, I used to go and sit in a, uh, in a church, and I would look at this sort of bleeding Christ figure. And when I was really young, you're going to laugh, but I thought the altar box underneath him was money for candy. So I, used to, <laughs> so I used to go to the altar box and take some money out from this bleeding figure and go and buy candy, because I figured it must have been waiting there for me. <laughs> and in those days, you know, people put five cents, ten cents in. It wasn't very much money, but... So I had a fairly intimate relationship to Christ that came essentially through my, he was my provider for candy for most of my early childhood up to about maybe, oh, I don't know, maybe five, six years old. 
Okay. So uh, it was a natural progression from the altar box to probably baptism, and um, which is interesting so. for a Jew, and uh, certainly just to begin to understand uh, that tradition, and that actually was very helpful for me later, and um, that that probably made it easier for me to come to know the masters, and um, it also uh, brought me closer to my. Spiritual mother Hilda Charlton, who I I lived with and studied with for 12 years, who was a Christian mystic and a Hindu, so I can understand that the early progression brought me to a place where I actually could sit at the feet of my own master. So. Okay, well, a couple of so that's a big jump, but you can see how the pieces just sort of fall into place step by step. Um, a couple of things pop into my mind: your connection with the spiritual masters. Certainly, I'd love to get into that a little. And um, and a Christian mystic and a Hindu. Now that's that's quite an interesting uh, combination. Though actually, uh, I guess like 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 myself, and like a lot of our viewers, uh, well, we're not exactly just one thing anymore, are we? We may have been born Jewish, or Baptist, or whatever, or or um, some type of Christian set. Uh, Group, but if you're probably if you're watching this film, then probably you are sort of like connected to all of it. Um, and I think of Gandhi in, in the in the great movie Gandhi, and he says, uh, "I am a Muslim. I am a Jew. I am a Hindu. I am uh, it's such such a great movie." Uh, uh, David Lean's uh, Gandhi, um, and such a great man. Um, so, so that's interesting. That that uh, Hindu and Christian. Um, so anyway, um, but tell me about your spiritual master, and tell me how it is you came to uh, get into Islam, and uh, and how you lived in Japan. You were in Japan, right? You know, I've been all over. <laughs> I'd love to hear about that. That all well, over what. Well, what, I think that if I went back, if I went back in time, uh, after uh, in my third year at Berkeley, so you, you now have someone who's been trained by her grandmother. You have somebody who's began to explore Christianity. You have someone who's been sitting in silence with the Quakers, and you have somebody who's been involved with social justice. And at a certain point, I'm in my at the end of my third year at Berkeley, and I um, just can't bear it. I, it I feel like I'm in books and not life, and I um, and my husband, uh, Yorgos, I told you I was married to a Greek. A Greek-American, or? Uh, he, his family was from uh, Thessaloniki in Istanbul. Okay. His name was uh, Yorgos Savidis, a wonderful, wonderful man who's not on this, this earth anymore. Uh, he and I spent two years traveling around the world, and I was about 20, 21 at the time. And during that time, I studied uh, in uh, indigenous and, and very small village life, the natural medicine, mm. and the spiritual life of these people. And so it, this journey took me uh, from Mauritania to Morocco, across uh, Greece and Turkey, into uh, uh, Af Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, and through the um, Southeast Asian home. And during that time, I collected uh, I collected life uh, through direct experience. I traveled uh, just with a small bag over my shoulder and one pair of clothes, which I... With your husband? With my husband, yeah. And how we managed is we taught English wherever we went and we were fed. And I also did healing, took care of people physically. Wow. And worked with the natural plants in the area. And that's how we managed for two years. When I came home, I opened up with my husband a center for natural healing and um, began to teach and uh, had students and managed in at that time to come in contact with a Gurdjieff teacher, Fourth Way School. And my husband and I ended up becoming his primary students. I'm not sure exactly what that means in terms of spiritual development. I think it mostly means something in terms of just hard work. Um, I managed um, the, uh, the kitchen and all of the things that a woman might manage if you have a gender division. And my uh, husband managed all the properties and things like that and the livestock. And, 
and we would teach at night when he wasn't there. We teach the students, and uh, he actually at a certain point went bad. If that makes any sense. Um, this Gorgiev teacher. Yeah, he did. He he began to get. Um, it, it makes a lot of sense. It happens it, all yeah, the time. Yeah, he just went bad. He he, he I mean, I learned a tremendous amount from him, um, but he began to take things from the older women, like their jewels or something, Whoa. and sell it. Whoa. You know, he would. You know. I remember one of the women was a, a beautiful piano teacher, and she lost her husband, and he asked for her uh, diamond engagement ring from that husband after he died, and he turned it into an airplane and something else, and when that's happened, um, Yorgos and I left, uh, and when we did, uh, about three quarters of the students left with us, and um, so we, we continued to teach them, and, um, and then at a certain point, uh, that had its own life and evolution, if, if I can say that. Uh, and we weren't trying to be the teachers or the gurus, it's just that uh, we had already been teaching them when the teacher wasn't present, and he got into a situation where he was spending more time away than with the students. So, so that was actually an introduction to, um, you know, if those of you who know Gurdjieff are listening, and you yourself, that tradition, I've seen the movie meetings with him. Yeah, remarkable that tradition man. has an influence, which is Sufi, and has an influence, which is a Christian, and and it's because of where Gurdjieff came out of his life and place. So that sort of set the seeds for my future study as a Sufi. And, okay. And that's that's where that came from. But I didn't go much further than that. I, I my husband kept carried those students, Ayorgos. And I myself took an initiation with a man named Kirpal Lu, who was the teacher of Amrit Desai and a man named Charles Brunner, who developed enlightenment intensities. But I actually took initiation with the, the teacher himself, and I began a very heavy practice in, in meditation and yoga. And uh, that went um, for quite a few years. And then I spontaneously, and I'm, I'm talking about meditating you know, 18 hours a day, 20 Whoa. hours a day. Very serious practice. I was living um, uh -huh. as a yogi during that time. And I actually went into the Saruba Nirvan Kalpa Samadhi, but I didn't actually know that that's what it was because it's not written about. It's the state of the walking dead. And I would have go through periods of time with, with no heartbeat or, or, oh, or no God. breath. And I... Um, had all kinds of multi-dimensional experiences. It wasn't uh, ungrounded, except that I couldn't explain the phenomena of being alive without heartbeat and breath. And it was my mother, my biological mother, Deva, who essentially sent me to my teacher, Hilda Charlton. She said, you know, if anybody I've met will know what's going on with you, it will be Hilda. So I flew out with her to her and talked to her about this experience, and she took me as a student. And I began to live with her and study with her for the next 12 years of my life. So that's that was that progression. Uh, all right, I have to ask about this. The state of the walking dead. Yes. With no heartbeat and no breath. That's right. It's it's a type of samadhi. This is a, a Hindu tradition that's it such is, a state exists? Yes, and, and actually you do read about it, but you don't know that that's what you're reading about. Um, I just had every imaginable Kundalini experience you could possibly imagine, including this one. And, um, well, you know, when, when teachers are sometimes left um, in states of samadhi, and the, sometimes they're even buried in the ground, there are different types of traditions with this. Okay. Uh, you can be in a state of suspended, um, I, I don't want to say, hard to describe the word, but some type of suspended state in relationship to the physical body for up to three weeks. And this actually is this type of samadhi. Yet um, walk around at the same time? Yeah, it is. It's called the walking samadhi. It's a walking, it's called the walking dead essentially, but you can, yeah. The walking samadhi, and, and you can interact with people and the world? And I, yes, you do, but what's strange about it is I, I kept my first question to Hilda is why am I not dead dead? Because you see, my teacher, Kirpal, who died, um, right about the time that I went into this state. So I didn't actually have a teacher to communicate with. And this is, um, this is kind of co commonly happens to all of us on the path where we can have a teacher, we can be developing, we come to a certain point and our, something happens to our teacher. 
and and this this was a, a really a difficult moment for me because I didn't actually have anybody to communicate the state of consciousness with. And um, mm -hmm. but Hilda understood it, knew about it, had actually experienced the states herself, and she brought me under instruction because. Um, as I teach my own students, uh, you know, it's easy to get up a mountain. It's much harder to get down it. Those of you who've climbed a high mountain, you know that coming down it is just harder if you've gone up a steep mountain. You have to be very careful coming down. And it's even harder to take what you've, what you've brought back with you out into the world and make it into mm. practical, mm. everyday, integrated experience because God consciousness is nothing if we aren't living and becoming the living God. Not as partners with God, but the face of God. That we, we express, we, we care, we are full of humility and humanity. And uh. Hilda, you know, really helped me come down the mountain. And it took her 11 years to get me down that mountain. Okay. And, and, and then another uh, set of years to bring it out into the world. I just, I just want to say... Um, people, I, I suppose, would be quite skeptical when they hear of such a thing, a uh, person walking around without a heartbeat or a breath. Um, yet, uh, and I would have never believed it myself until I read a book called Autobiography of a Yogi by Yogananda, which is the story of his life, of course, and the, the amazing uh, great Indian masters, he calls them the Christ Yogis of India, who did things like this, and people who lived without eating or drinking there, and, and his own experiences, not only did he meet them, he became one of these Christed yogis. There is so much more to, uh, I mean, we are essentially light beings. So there's so much more to living than uh, what the scientists will tell us. Um, yeah, it's incredible, and I never did hear that. Um, you didn't breathe. No. You didn't. Not for periods of time, and then it would return. Like and what kind of periods of time? Um, I couldn't say, but... Are we talking hours? Yes, days? hours. It could be hours. Um, it oh, could, my God. It could be hours. Days, I don't have a memory of days, but I have a memory of hours. And how do you know your heart wasn't beating? Uh, because I try to find a pulse. Okay, but maybe it was beating very, very... No, it wasn't beating. I went to doctors. You, <laughs> I, had, I, <laughs> you had doctors who said... I think I was examined. I couldn't, I honestly couldn't figure it out because I couldn't find it anywhere. I couldn't find it. I, I could not find this in books. I didn't understand what was taking place. You had doctors tell you your heart is not beating? Yes. <laughs> but then they, can they explain the fact that when they took photographs of... Padre Pio, I think it was Padre Pio that had his heart severed like Jesus. I'm pretty sure it's Padre Pio. Well, he I'm, was incredible. He had the stigmata, and he also had a severed heart. Technically, I, my memory, and forgive me, listeners, if I don't remember, I'm getting to the age where sometimes things get a little bit crazy, but my memory of, uh, of reading about Padre Pio is that he actually, they did x-rays of his heart, and it was severed in a place that would have created simply either the incapacity for it to beat or not to function correctly, and he was fine. Uh, so you can't really, you know, there's all kinds of phenomena like this. Uh, I just want to say at the end of the Yogananda book, Autobiography of a Yogi, there's a letter, a, a testimonial by the uh, head coroner of Los Angeles, which is a very, very high position, and he testifies that the body of Yogananda doesn't decompose. It de uh, he, first of all, he left his body at will, uh, which I understand is called the, the, the Great Samadhi. He, he gave a speech to the Indian, uh, in front of the Indian ambassador. India was a new country, but, uh, relatively. And uh, he gave this beautiful speech before a crowd of people. And, and then the, his body just collapsed. And there's this letter from the Los Angeles coroner <laughs> that the body doesn't decompose and that there's no bad smell. And uh, so, I mean, if you, if you look into the uh, tradition of the masters of India, including Sai Baba and, well, so many, and read this book, well, it doesn't quite completely shock me because nothing will... Sh 
I think probably at this point, nothing should shock shock us at this point. After I I read that book and read other things as well. So, okay, that's amazing. So, okay, you you found, thank God, your teacher, Hilda. That's right. And she was also, well, here we are. The Hindu, the this and a Christian, mystic. and a Christian also, and okay. she was with the masters. Okay, and that goes back to the masters, and she trained me in the masters when I was with her. And you said it took her eleven years to bring you down from this mountain, and, and another we, eleven years to so that you could bring your teaching out into the world. Or did I get that, that wrong? Yeah, no, that's correct. But that what, ha- years. what happened at the, that transition point is is that I met my Sufi um, teacher. Uh, what I, transition point? The transition point. Hilda passed, and uh, after twenty-two years. No, nope, Hilda passed after I knew her for eleven years, and she passed. Okay. And that wasn't a clear statement that I gave you before, because I strung one thought with another. So I understand why you might think that it was twenty-two years. No. Okay. But um, but what happened is is that uh, I made a transition uh, at the end of Hilda's life. Actually, before she passed, I met a, a Sufi master who. Um, trained me, really, I would say trained me on how to how to express all of this in the world. And at that point, when I met him, I had three children. Uh, uh, I was living primarily as a yogini, so then that part of my life began to come into expression. And I was uh, trained and with that teacher for the next, it's more, it took him 11 years, but I would say I was a teacher for 25 years, you know, it was a long time. And, um, but the intensive instruction was 11 years. I never left that teacher, and I never left Hilda. Um, I did leave the, the Bogi Gurdjieff guy when he went, what I call, went bad. Properly uh, so. Anybody can go bad at any time. If we can fall under fame, fortune, power, I don't know, whatever, you know, any of the, um, the, the classic uh, allurements are possible. And Hilda taught that. She said, you know, you can be the, the highest master, and you can fall. And we have that in our tradition, don't we, as Jews? We can say somebody can be, you know, so perfect, and then the last minute they they don't make the return. Or a person can be completely uh, living a a terrible life and make a a terrible life and make teshuvah before they pass. Well, that's actually one of the amazing things about the uh, the Old Testament and even and the Torah. None of these uh, biblical heroes. I mean, they're they're portrayed there with. Uh, warts and all, you know, their their sins and their faults and you know big sins and big faults like King David uh, and how and how he uh, found his wife, the mother of Solomon, Bathsheba, and he sent her, her husband to uh, to the front over and over and over again. So he, I mean, this is a, an amazing thing about uh, the Bible. Um, the, the uh, Old Testament and the Torah. So also Moses, his sins, uh, his failures anyway. Um, okay, so you use the phrase, she was with the masters, Hilda, Hilda was with the masters. And you, uh, I understand that you have that blessing as well. What do you say that, what do you mean? Do you mean that you see them, you hear them, they come to you, you know, they hang out with you. What do you mean by that? I'm envious here, yes. Makes me think of the movie that you're gonna that you're gonna watch that I'm gonna give you on Saint Hildegard. Because okay. one of the things the little girls, uh, her little Yuta and Hildegard have to recite with each other is uh, something from about envy, which is very sweet. They describe it like the claws of a bear. But anyway, you'll see that next week. I'm so sorry I didn't bring okay. it today. But it's fine. We got it. Daphne, who's sitting here with us. Uh, she's talking about a movie about the life of Hildegard. Hildegard. It's called Vision, oh. and it's an extraordinary movie about St. Hildegard von Bingham, and I recommend it to everybody. It, it uh, is in German with English subtitles. But uh, she was the founder, actually, of Western herbalism and um, healed with stones and plants and... Uh, music and she made beautiful uh, illustrations and this was in the 1100s so and she was quite a forward thinker so. and she was a woman and they didn't shut her up or close they, her tried. Down. they tried they tried but she actually ended up being uh, 
and she would go into trance-like states, although she was conscious and her eyes open, and she would re receive everything from what she called the light. And um, so the association for me is, is that I would say that she also was with the masters, and um, what I saw and what I've read, I'm reading her work right now, uh, it's, she, she carries that quality. You mean you're reading translation, English translation? Yeah, they, there's a lot that's come out um, about her, and obviously there's a lot of interest since the movie was produced by a very famous director in Germany, uh, this movie Vision, and her music is playing throughout it, and her music she created was for healing, uh, and it's, it's very powerful and very beautiful Gregorian style music. But, um, and my mother Hilda, spirit, spiritual mother Hilda was, uh, her, na sh her namesake was, uh, was Hildegard von Bingham. So uh, there's a connection between yes. the Hildas and a connection between the line mm -hmm. that came through to me from my mother Hilda Charlton uh, through uh, Hildegard von Bingham. So this is not just a, an idle, idle connection, it's an active and alive. I just went to her monastery a couple of days, well I've been here in Israel for a week, but just before I came here I went to the monastery where her relics are and she is, uh, the amount of spiritual energy that was in that small mm. church was uh, outstanding and I've done a lot of visiting of sacred sites in my life, I'm going to be 66 and yeah, and you I, know, you know, I've been around, you know, <laughs> it's like, and I, th I was astounded at how much was there. She's a really a living presence there, not just an abstract presence. And uh, so if some of you have never heard about her, enjoy, because you're going to have a very modern saint uh, that lived in body um, 900 years ago. Amazing. It's amazing. I'm looking forward. Okay, tell me about your relationship with the masters. Do you see him? Do I see the masters? The masters live in the buddhic plane. And that plane of consciousness is higher feeling, which most of you are listening, I'm sure you know that. And primarily that's their abode. abode. That's where the, the realm of the masters is, the Great White Lodge. That's when it's described that way. Um, so if one travels in consciousness into the buddhic realm, if one has a buddhic body that's functional, which is a particular body that's composed of buddhic energy, which is one of the bodies that um, people potentially can have, uh, one can interact directly with them in their realm. And you, um, you get to this realm in your buddhic body? Correct. And um, You interface with your buddhic body in that realm, correct. What is the realm like? Well, the realm, the buddhic realm, uh, and I wish I could quote directly uh, from the Upanishads, but I have, can give you an approximation, but it was described like a peacock, and this is in their language, and it's the eye is, I think the eye was bliss, and uh, the tail was peace, and the, the wings were harmony. Um, I think if you think about it in that way, or it, and there's you know Sanskrit words for this. The um, this is the quality of it. From a Christian point of view, you're talking about uh, the quality of Mary, and you're quality, talking about the quality of the heart of Jesus itself. But are there like that's do, what the quality is like? Do we have like light? Do we see people in their light bodies? Are there like light trees and light temples and stuff like there that? There is a there is a realm in there. Um, it's interesting, the realm where the masters are, the buddhic plane has more than just the masters, but the abode of the masters, for some reason, uh, and I don't understand all of it, um, but it's constructed based on the, on the harmony and the geometry of uh, classical Greece. Now that's interesting, it doesn't, doesn't completely surprise me. So you mean there are temples that look like Greek temples? Yes, that's correct. And, and you could see a master maybe like Jesus in his light body, and he would look like Jesus um, that people think of? I, I can't say that that's the case. In other words, because Jesus, when you tell me about how people think of Jesus, for me, because I live and work with indigenous people all over the world, um, 
Jesus looks a lot of different ways. Oh, Jesus, okay. Jesus doesn't look the way we see them with the sort of the blonde brown hair with the blue eyes and that particular sort of Western concept. Jesus comes black and brown and Jesus comes not tall and sometimes he's short. And um, But how does he look there? There he doesn't, you don't take on form in the sense that you see things uh, as the picture that you might have something like, for example, here's a picture here. I believe that's a picture of Jesus. It is indeed. And probably a one that somebody has thought about him in relationship to the Masters. I'm guessing that that may be more like a Masters picture of him. Uh, you wouldn't see that necessarily in that form. The buddhic body doesn't perceive in visual. The buddhic body perceives in, a, a, in very fine feeling. So you would perceive it through feeling, not through, through, through the eyes. Uh. You'd have to come into the into the realm of the physical uh, to see him in a physical form as you would perceive it in the picture across from us. But you say the temples look like Greek temples. They have the harmony, I said, ah. and the geometrics. You said that they look like Greek temples. Okay. I said they have the har they're based on the harmony and the geometrics of classical Greece. But that is comes, n the impression comes from, not from, um, uh, uh, the, the visual construct as we would we would cognate it in this dimension. Uh, see, the bodies operate in relationship to their own laws. The buddhic dimension and the buddhic body has a, sip, a particular relationship to um, to space. It's not a time world. Uh, the mental or body has a different type of way of perceiving. The causal um, okay. is something else, and um, each one of them is different. So you can get a form, of a, a, a pictorial form, actually, in causal, which you won't necessarily get in Buddhic. Uh, Buddhic is feeling. Feeling. So yeah. you, feel like, you feel like the energy body of the temple or of the master. Well, can and you, you imagine like coming in? I mean, this is in the feeling body from the physical realm. But imagine that you come into the room and something, uh, something kind of comes over you. And then you can, out of that, you actually can produce a form and feeling. Like it would be like palpating a, a, a space of warmth or something. And you could feel its shapes based on the feeling, but not necessarily by visual perception. Okay, I could sort of get that. Yeah, so it's, it's a coming from a different perceptive place. And but, not, but not by sense feeling in the, of the physical sense. Yeah. And, and, you know, but I understand, like, I've read this guy, Dr. Michael Newton. We love the things of the earth, like trees and stuff like that. Just out of curiosity, are there like trees there? And birds? And it's, I, I, you know, I don't want to confuse you, but it won't, it won't have the same perception. I understand. Yeah. But, okay. is there, but is there a reflection of the physical world here in the Buddhic? Yes. Okay. There is. In other words, what we what we experience here is possible to have a uh, first. You have a physical form, then you would have the etheric double of it, which would be the the, the subtle etheric tree. Uh, the tree could uh, we have the idea of the tree, which would be causal, right? We could have the 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 essence of the tree, uh, the quality and the essence of the tree in the Buddhic. Do you mm. see? And, and it's actually so. It's a world. I guess it's a world of essence is the way you could describe it. It's the fragrance of the tree in the feeling world. It's a fragrance, a feeling fragrance. Okay. And I, you, everybody's had this. It, I, it's very hard to find language for it because we all are so conditioned to try to explain something in terms of this type of form, uh, the couch here or, or your chair that you're sitting in or my chair. Um, but it, it's, it's, it doesn't duplicate that way. Sometimes the masters radiate through the dimensions and they p can and have the capacity to take on a form in the etheric double of the physical. And people then perceive them as you might perceive that picture there in a light form. That is not directly in the buddhic dimension. It's in the dimension of the etheric double of the physical. Okay. They, then they often communicate directly into causal. They, they manifest through causal mind and they directly communicate an idea without form into the ca our causal body, our causal mind, which then filters into our what we call lower mind, which is really logical mind, into our emotional body, which is uh, the, the world of human feeling, 
or, or everyday feeling, and then we might have, as I said before, a, a manifestation. And so they can appear and stand in a room. Well, according to Yogananda, um, his teacher, his master, Sri Yukteswar, whose photo is here, um, in the tradition of, uh, of these type of masters, he's, when, he, when he passed on, they burned his body, and then he came again to Yogananda in, yeah. his, in a physical body, and there's a whole chapter it appears in the as book. A, it appears as a physical body. Well, they hugged. Yeah, they hugged. Hug. Yeah. And uh, the chapter is called The Resurrection yeah. of Sri Yukteswaraj. And well, they're called masters. Yeah. So, I mean, they live the, up to the name. I those guess. bodies are actually uh, theric doubles, and a, a master is uh, able to create a subtle body that has the appearance, the feeling, and the state of a physical body. But it actually is a in the etheric double of the physical. And the better somebody is at, at the manifestation of that, the more uh, physical it is. But it isn't physical in the same sense as his original birth body. Okay. San Germain is famous for this. That's correct. And so is Jesus. And so yes. is Jesus. Yeah, Jesus. And these are sometimes called immortal bodies. Okay. That's one of the ways that they're described. And they are tangible. You could shake a hand and feel a hand. But they didn't go through the cycle of birth and, and, and you know, they, they didn't go through this corporal, uh, co this is not a corporal um, body as we would know it in terms of our child that was just born or the original one that he had. Or with all its weaknesses and uh, it's a perfect Exactly. It's they a perfect there's body. no disease. It's a perfect body. Yeah, the etheric double of the physical that's taken a full um, physical, uh, seemingly physical existence. In other words, it's taken on the qualities of firmness, let's say. Um, it does not have disease. It's not. It's not under the conditions of the the uh, the earthbound body anymore. Okay. okay. Does I, that seem clear? Yes. Okay. Good. I had a teacher who used to say uh, that uh, no matter who the person is or how lowly they may seem or how bad they're doing things, she she said to me something to the effect that actually we're all masters on the Buddhic plane. Uh, does everybody have a parallel self who is a master on the Buddhic plane? Um, I'm not sure what she was telling you, but uh, so I don't want to contradict anything that she said. The, the Buddhic body itself, um, we do have access to the Buddhic plane and Buddhic consciousness. Everyone has a Buddhic body in a, a uh, an undeveloped state. Okay. The, the actual full-blown booty body requires a type of stability in the lower mental and lower emotional body because the quality of the, of the, of the booty is so subtle and the feeling is so, I mean, bliss, harmony, peace, that if you are violently angry with your lower body, you it tends to rupture. Ha <laughs> ha. Do you understand? You rupture that body. It doesn't die. But it's imagine it's something that's grown to a full size, and this violent energy passes through the energy thing. It kind of it it kind of goes down into a smaller. It's like a flower that goes back into its sort of night position until yes. the sun comes back again. So yes, in potential, it's accurate. But whether it's actually activated all the time is another story, and that depends on how we respond to our daily life, and that's why we all have to come to terms with our humanity and our feelings of, of, of hurt and, and confusion and pain and anger, uh, not to become like robots, but to begin to be, um, find a way to be kind with ourselves and our humanity and to be kind with others with their humanity. In other words, if you're going through violent emotion and deep sorrow and all this heavy emotion, you, don't, you can't have that sensitivity to, uh, which grows and grows and maybe develops into this thing called the Buddhic body. Uh, yeah. We have it to begin with. If you could just imagine a little tiny humunculus of a Buddhic body and then a full one, full one, like a grown up one, which has much more capacity for expression. The rupturing of it, when I say rupture, that's the wrong word. What I mean, it just, it's just kind of, you know, returns to, its, to itself into a smaller, more, you know, form and, and not as activated, that's all. And then as we as we begin to live more fully in our full uh, compassion itself, 
what happens is it can, it can express and it can grow its wings. The peacock can fly, if we go back to the original Hindu image. It was and a beautiful peacock. And if you're eating Big Macs and white flour and white sugar and uh, watching, uh, I don't know, professional wrestling, then it's very hard uh, if you're developing these very um, uh, vulgar tastes somehow or uh, that to develop this sensitivity of, and allow the buddhic body, uh, I mean, you have to have a pure diet, don't you? You have to. You know, I don't know. I, I, you know, you're, you're talking to somebody who's been, I've been teaching for 47 years, okay? Okay. <laughs> it's a long time. I, I have seen everything, darling. I have seen uh, people who eat Big Macs and watch wrestling, and I've seen people who, who and I need to smoke some marijuana in order to stabilize themselves emotionally. I've seen everything. The question is, how does somebody carry their life, not what it is itself? For me, wrestling and Big Macs wouldn't work. Okay. Uh, <laughs> nor would smoking marijuana and drinking alcohol. But I have seen, you know, very developed teachers um, and, and, and very developed people who, who live in a, in a state of moderation. And moderation okay. can happen in many forms. So I wouldn't want to say one thing equals spirituality and something doesn't. Mostly it's how we live with, how we live with each other and how we live with ourselves. Okay. So I keep a very open mind. When a student comes to me, I really want to see what actually works for them um, in terms of how do they bring moderation into their life so they can express all of what they are. Okay, I like that. I'm not, I'm not a don't do this and don't do that person. It's like what works to make you, you fully you, fully living you, you are the become the, the face of the living God. Not God, but the face. You carry the face of your beloved God. I love when you say fully you. It reminds me um, of a subtitle of a Seth book, which I read years ago. Uh, and the subtitle of the book was the, um, the Eternal Validity of the Soul. Okay? I don't remember the major title. Maybe it was Seth Speaks. I think, I think it is Seth Speaks. I it, think that's the okay. one that talks about this. Okay, okay, but the subtitle, The Eternal Ability of the Soul, that stayed with me. A lot of people, maybe even very much in the East, sort of have this idea that we sort of like melt away into oneness. And, um, and, and whenever people talk in that way with me, uh, I keep thinking of Seth's phrase, The Eternal validity of the soul, which implies that we don't just melt away into the great oneness, into the all, to, to the, lay down, the one great big blob. Um, what about the eternal validity of the soul and individuality, these great masters? Um, they're individuating, are they not? They are... You, you, can, you cannot develop spiritually without a self. An individuated self. Absolutely. You cannot. A soul personality. Absolutely. You cannot develop without it. God doesn't want us to just melt back into him, her, whatever. I think the question is, what does that really mean? I what, think, it, what does it mean? Yeah, exactly. I think that, when pe that there's a lot of confusion. I, when you translate, forgive me, but when you translate tr cross-culturally, there's always going to be uh, some form of misunderstanding. I, and I'm just going to make a caveat for the listeners because I'm teaching, uh, I'm actually functioning, uh, training people just about every major religion without them changing their religion. I mean, when I teach somebody, I, 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 don't, I don't have any followers. I'm not teaching one religion or one way. I'm interested in the person and what works for them and what is their path. And I, there's just a lot of confusion. When you take a Hindu concept, something out of Sanskrit, which for most people has already been translated into their native language, which means you've already lost a chunk of it to begin with. You bet. And then you get all the cross-cultural differences. Um, I feel like, uh, since I'm teaching students in so many different cultures, I feel like I come up short all the time. I, I'm constantly working with them for them to really teach me culturally, because I'm going to have a bias, and my bias is I am a Berkeley Jew. <coughs> Okay. Yeah, it's a bias. It's it's it's. I'm a, I'm typical. Uh, I talk like I'm from California. I talk fast like I'm from California. Forgive me, listeners. <laughs> you know, it's just I, I look like it. My hand movements are like it. 
Um, you look like a hippie a little bit. Yeah, right? exactly. And you know, I'm a 65 and a half year old hippie. Yeah. And yes, I pay my bills, and I I've, I've raised three children, and I have a wonderful marriage, and blah blah blah. But I'm still. This is what I came from. And why not? Wouldn't I be eclectic spiritually? Coming from Berkeley, you right? Can. Exactly. So it, it, it's just there's a bias. And I think that we suffer from uh, the fact that we have such an extraordinary exposure to different uh, views uh, of things, and then suffering from translation, and then suffering from trying to construct something uh, more based on our mind conceiving of an idea, which then creates the experience, and then we validating our experience by the idea we started with, which may have nothing to do with anything to begin with. And many of us are suffering from this not having a teacher, which happened to me when my one teacher died between a year and a half between Kerpal Lu and Hilda, was a disaster. <laughs> me trying to put together an understanding of what was going on. So, and I'm not advertising for people to find a teacher, but I just think that we all suffer from this. This is a natural state of the human condition. So what it means to be absorbed in the divine doesn't mean to lose anything of this world in the sense of being able to function here. The question is, what's the perspective? Is it the perspective of unity? Is it the perspective of distinction within unity? Or is it the perspective of separation? And no. that's the difference between God consciousness and ego consciousness. Yes, yes. That's it. And absorbed in something doesn't mean losing in distinction. It means being able to receive within the distinction. Yes. The divine will. Hmm. And that's it's a very simple a simple concept. The divine will uh, is that the equivalent of our own true will? Yes, I think you could call it that. I think that we since we come from the divine will by nature, we are within the creation, we're part of the creation, then we aren't separated from it. So it is our true will. But in the but we 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 struggle to return to that state because through history and through conditioning and through the environment that we are brought into, we have to harness our humanness, our humanity to divine will and to leave um, the part of us that would only be thinking about ourselves. And that's the journey. That's the journey. We all and once we harness our will, that doesn't mean we have to be vig stop being vigilant. We have to always remember uh, the experience of the, of the other. I have to remember you. I have to remember you who are listening. And, and honestly, they're watching. You're watching, and I and I'm looking mostly at Eliyahu because I can only see a camera, a red camera. And the, fortunately, I can see the face of Jesus across from me. I see uh. my beloved Daphne who's sitting on a couch, and you can't see her. But it's. Um, this right, we're actually in the living experience right now of remembering. I have to keep remembering you. It's easier for me to remember you than it is for me to remember all of you. And I keep having to, to bring that back into my consciousness. This is not a camera sitting in front of me. It's all of you out there who have, have come to this moment to, to enter into this dialogue with Eliyahu and myself. Or I'm entering into this dialogue with you, except you don't have a name. Maybe, maybe it's you that I'm listening to. Uh -huh. Do you understand? It's not, it's not as separate as we might perceive it, or I might perceive it. And I have to wake up and remember this. We have to keep waking up. It's not you, automatic. You say waking up. And actually, reality is sort of just, some people will say that it's sort of a mass hypnosis. And you know, hypnosis is a fascinating thing. I've just been watching a lot of David Wilcock. I don't know if you know who he is. I do. I do. Um, brilliant stuff on his uh, website. I find it brilliant. Uh, DivineCosmos.com. He's got these free films. Um, he talks about uh, mass hypnosis. For instance, there's a very it's a, a well-known and true story. A man hypnotizes a father. And he gives him a, a, a suggestion. He says to the father, uh, a post-hypnotic suggestion, when you come out of the hypnosis, you won't be able to see your daughter, even if she's, you won't be able to see her. Um, and um, and it, it will last a certain while. There was no, as far as I could tell, there was no bad intent at all. He was trying to 
to prove something to an audience. So um, he takes him out of hypnosis, and uh, the daughter is right there giggling, standing in front of him. The father doesn't see her. And he's asked, well, do you see your daughter around anywhere? And he can't see his daughter. She's standing right in front of him. He takes out, uh, at a certain point, he, he, he takes out um, a pocket watch with an inscription. He holds the, uh, the, the back of the pocket watch with the inscription um, right behind the daughter who's standing right in front of the father. And he asks the father what, what he sees in front of him. And the father answers he sees a pocket watch. Not only does he see the pocket watch, which he's never seen before, he doesn't know about it. He's able to read the inscription of the pocket watch, which is written on the, on the back of it. He see, in other words, he sees through his daughter. And um, so what's coming up here is the question of what is reality? Is this chair that we're sitting on, the chairs that we're sitting on, the room that we're sitting in, Apparently, it's just an agreed upon concept that we've been trained to be able to to feel and to see, and um, it, it's it's a density, it's a frequency. This chair, his daughter, is uh, vibrating at frequency density, a vibration of frequency density, and he was hypnotized in, in uh, not being able to see that density of what, which is his daughter, that frequency. And so he doesn't see her. Um, so what is reality? Aren't we all creating a mutual reality all the time? Um, they say that when the conquistadors came to South America, this is, there are many stories of this, the natives couldn't see the ships. And only when the ships came really, really close and one of their shamans was able to, to, to see the ship and then he would describe it to the people, well, you know, there's something out there and it's really strange, but it looks like this and this and this and this. And only then could the people see the, the ships of the, the Spanish. So what is reality and where is it going? We've, we've built this... Uh, agreed upon world and I think it's changing big time right now. Everybody says so. The Mayans say so. Uh, all, all kinds of prophecies from all kinds of peoples all over the world say so that it's changing big time. So what is reality, Laura? And uh, what world are we going to create next? And uh, do you have any of well, I, I, you know, I, I don't know, the, you know, specifically about I, what you're describing to me is not at all uh, unfamiliar, and um, we can and do know from science that the amount of matter, for example, if we were to condense it for a human, would be a very tall, small size p, maybe on on the end of a pin, and that would be. Um, maybe all the, the matter as of you or me uh, could be condensed to that and even within that matter there's space. So ultimately what we're talking about is what we perceive as solid is organized space. And so I myself personally uh, during the early stages of my development had had, had perceived and seen through what is, would be considered solid matter. Um, Sai Baba was famous for standing in the middle of a pillar. Um, masters have been known to walk through walls. Right. Yes. Yeah. So it's true, and I, that's so that's completely conceivable that a person could c uh, come out of a state of a hypnotic state and may not perceive something that is um, would be recognized as solid for another person in the room and not actually perceive it. Uh, I don't have a problem with that. I. I don't necessarily, I don't think it's 
I don't know if we can actually describe or define reality uh, on, on terms like that. I think that there's a um, an evolution, uh, an unfold, an unfoldment of which unfoldment actually is not a word. Unfold is, but I like to say unfoldment of uh, <laughs> of, of of human consciousness and. Um, the representation of this in the physical world. And I don't think it's a static process. I think that um, we each can, how we, how we organize our lives and how we organize our thought and how we organize our feeling, uh, as we come under t to live d more deeply inside of compassion and love and trust and truth and all of the basic qualities that I would say are the, are the principles of, of, of the great religions, uh, the principles that don't produce separations but produce unity, I think that we have an opportunity to, um, to see a, a shift in, in the environment around us. And if we do not come under these, these spiritual guidelines or ways of living, we will see a, a disintegration of the culture around us and the beauty and the harmony. Um, Wouldn't you agree it'll be a disintegration before a reintegration of something new? I don't know, because the divine is not logical and linear. So, I mean, that would be a logical and linear thought, but uh, the world of the divine doesn't necessarily follow uh, any of that. So how something would happen or not happen may or may not happen in a time sequence or before and after. The world of unity does not have number, does not have levels, and doesn't have before and after. So I couldn't say, we've had enough things that we believe happen almost timelessly, like that some of these things that happened um, before the human as we know it existed. Um, we, I can't say, I couldn't say, but what I'm more interested in is not what's to come. What I'm interested in is how I can be of service in a, in, right here and now in this moment. How can I affect in a positive way um, the people that I meet on a daily basis, no matter where they are, in the supermarket, on the train, the plane, the subway, the person who opens up the door in a hotel, um, how can I be a person with it? When I walk past that person, that I have a, a healthy uh, human experience. In other words, that I, I am a, in healthy interaction with that human being in a, in a way that promotes life and balance and harmony for them. Well, what advice can you give us so that we could live in that way where every interaction we have is as much as possible positive and serving and loving um, and, uh, well, and, and of course we're not always there. Sometimes no. we don't feel good. That's Sometimes right. we're, we get angry. It's a work in progress every day. In every moment. So, what advice can you give us to to be the best people we could be? I think probably, which may sound kind of non-linear, I would say that most of what you think and feel that's negative has nothing to do with you, and you need to remember that. Ah. And I think if you can remember that, because we do sometimes do generate these thoughts, but actually, my experience is that about ninety-eight or ninety-nine percent of most of what we experience has been generated by someone else. So if you can remember yourself in the midst of that, I think you're going to experience a lot of liberation and self-love. Um, again, about David Wilcock, he talks exactly about this in the film I just saw, which is called, the film is called The Source Field Investigation. It's on his website, it's, you could also Google uh, that on YouTube. And he says this, this source field, which is a consciousness field, which is uh, uh, the universal mind. And we're all connected like in this universal, this what they call the world tree. And everybody's thoughts influences everybody else, uh, else's thoughts. And, uh, and the creator, who is also, uh, who is us, also, uh, that we can connect with this, the source field, its quality is love. It's a cry, on, cry on calls it the love source. Uh, and so it's all, influencing us. We could, the more we could be in tune, to, attuned to the source field, the more loving and peaceful we could be. But everybody's thoughts is influencing everybody. Um, and he also says that um, the more harmonious though is the stronger influence. 
it's true, I may have neighbors. That's true. I may have neighbors who are angry or jealous or whatever, but even if there's one uh, neighbor who's loving and kind, that's more powerful than any of the other stuff. Um, and so we can, we can hopefully bring that into the world. Um, You're going to have to forgive me, but my beloved here, Daphne, who brought me, has to go pick up her daughter at school. Ken, Ken, I knew, <laughs> so I'm going to I'm gonna to need come, to go, and you have to forgive me, everyone. I knew it everyone. to come to an end sometime. <laughs> <Yeah>. um, <laughs> And uh, we can do it again. I'll be back in Israel in, in April, God willing. I'll be here. Uh, any last comments? Nope, Nora. that's it. It's just that uh, thank you for the opportunity and the honor to uh, to do this with you. And I always love seeing you. And I think it's very neutral. I think you're a great inspiration to us all. Well, thank you. We all. You're your own teacher. <laughs> okay, I do my best. We all do our best. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Nora. Thank you.